Hi, um, I'm the executive director of the IRC Institute. We fund data-driven objective research, both practitioner and academic research. Um, in just four years, our award has uh, grown to be a centerpiece of this event. Last year, sparked coverage, not just in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, but editorials in the Wall Street Journal and Times and CNBC. Um, so it, it actually shouldn't surprise me, but it did, that the last two speakers and panels were perfect lead-ins to the two awards. The first award is the Academic Prize. I should note that these come not only with a lovely crystal um, award, but with $10,000, so we actually get good submissions from people. Um, and the winning academic research is passive investors, not passive owners. And this demonstrates that while passive investors, such as index funds, aren't active owners in the traditional sense of buying or selling, using exit, the research finds that index funds use large voting blocks to exercise material effects on corporate governance of public companies. Um, I will leave the details of those effects to Ian Appel uh, from Boston College, professor of finance, who will be presenting the findings. Ian's co-authors on this are Todd Gormley at Wharton and Donald Keim at Wharton. Um, I should note that it's very, um, it, Scott Stringer provided a perfect lead into this when he was talking about his proxy access project and why they did it because they owed everything. We just heard about universal orders, diversified versus non-diversified, and they don't have the ability to sell. And what they need is some place to put $155 billion to earn something above the rate of inflation or at their actuarial interest rate forever. And so they try, in our Milstein's words, to get the herd to run. And um, I think Professor Appel and his co-authors uh, demonstrate the methods in which they do that. And with that, I'd be glad to present this award to Ian. All right, thank you. We'll take a picture later. But uh, in the meantime, there's the award. I, well, I guess we'll take a picture now. Is, Thanks. All right, thank you very much, John. It's an honor to be here. As John said, this is a joint work with Todd Gormley and Don Keim at Wharton. Now, the title of the paper is Passive Investors, Not Passive Owners. And I think John did a good job of summing up what this is about. The idea is pretty simple. We're just saying that just because you follow a passive investment strategy does not necessarily mean that you're passive in terms of your views on governance and ultimately how you engage with managers. We actually borrow this title from an article written by Glenn Borium at Vanguard, in which he argues that Vanguard cares quite a bit about corporate governance and takes a number of actions to ensure compliance with what they view as strong governance practices. Now, by passive institutional investors, we mean these large institutional investors who hold diversified portfolios designed to mimic the returns of a particular index. As we see by the figure on this slide, passive ownership has increased dramatically from about 10% in 1998 all the way up to over 30% by 2014. Now, it's not necessarily clear if this is a good thing. For instance, there was a cover article in The Economist back in February which wrote that a rising chunk of the stock market sits in the hands of lazy investors. Index funds and exchange traded funds mimic the market's movements and typically take little interest in how firms are run. Now it's worth noting that passive investors have aggressively tried to push back against this idea. So in this paper, we're asking, do the passive investors affect corporate governance? And there's certainly reasons to think why the answer to this may be no. First off, these passive investors, since they're unwilling to accumulate shares or exit their positions, they may lack influence. Furthermore, they may lack motivation if they're only trying to mimic the market's returns, and so they may not care about the returns of one particular stock. However, there's other reasons to think that passive institutions may in fact strengthen corporate governance. So first off, these investors have a fiduciary duty to their own investors, 
Furthermore, they may be motivated if fund flows respond not only to, abs uh, to relative to performance, but also to absolute performance. And finally, these investors argue that since they're unable or unwilling to exit their positions, they care even more about corporate governance than other types of investors. Now, ultimately answering this question uh, poses an empirical challenge. And this is for the simple reason that correlation does not imply causation. That is, we may be worried about that firms with higher passive ownership are different in other ways. So for instance, they could have higher active ownership as well. Now, in order to disentangle these effects, we need to use what us economists refer to as a natural experiment. That is, we need some sort of quasi-random variation in passive ownership. So in this paper, what we're going to do is we're going to use variation in passive ownership generated by the cutoff between the Russell 1000 and the Russell 2000 indices. So briefly, these indices are constructed each June when Russell ranks the top 3,000 stocks according to market capitalization, and then cuts off the top 1,000 stocks and calls out the Russell 1000, and uses the next 2,000 stocks as the Russell 2000 index. It's worth pointing out that Russell has changed this methodology in recent years, but we're only looking at the period from when this is precisely what they were doing. Now, it's important to note that these indices are value-weighted, and so portfolio weights will vary considerably around this threshold. This is demonstrated in the following slide. So in the first panel, we're plotting the portfolio weights for the bottom 500 firms in the Russell 1000 index. And in the second panel, we're plotting the weights for the top 500 firms in the Russell 2000. Now, as you would expect, there's a large jump in portfolio weights for stocks that are at the top of the Russell 2000. Now, it turns out there's a similar amount of assets tracking these two indices. And so ultimately, passive ownership will be higher for stocks at the top of the Russell 2000. And this is demonstrated by the following figure. So here we're just taking the, 500, the bottom 500 stocks in the Russell 1000 and the top 500 stocks in the Russell 2000, and then we're just lining them up by market capitalization. And as you would expect, there's a break in passive ownership at the cutoff between the two indices. And specifically, passive ownership, which we're measuring using mutual fund holdings here, is about 66% higher. Now we're ultimately interested in studying how these passive investors influence governance. We specifically focus on governance outcomes that are explicitly mentioned by passive investors as being important aspects of corporate governance. So what we find is that passive ownership is associated with more independent directors. We also find that passive ownership is associated with a higher likelihood of removing anti-takeover provisions. So these could be things like poison pills or restrictions on shareholders calling special meetings. And finally, we find that firms have fewer dual class shares when passive ownership is higher. So there's one share, one vote, and this is a very another, another common thing that passive investors talk about. We next look at what are the possible mechanisms that allow passive investors to have this influence. So one obvious possibility is the power of their voice. These passive institutions hold very large stakes, and along with this comes significant voting rights. And so we find evidence that this is in fact an important mechanism. Specifically, we find that when passive ownership is higher, support for shareholder governance proposals, non-binding resolutions, is higher as well. Furthermore, we find that there's lower support for management proposals when passive ownership is higher, suggesting that management faces a, a more hostile or a more discerning shareholder base in some sense. We also investigate the possibility that passive investors may be facilitating activism by other types of investors. For instance, it could be that if an activist investor can get just one or two of these large passive institutions on its side, this may ultimately increase the chances that an activist campaign will succeed. However, we don't find any evidence that that's actually the case. If anything, we find that hedge fund activism declines when passive ownership is higher. And so this suggests that passive owners may be preempting the need for activists to come in in the first place. Finally, we turn our attention to performance. Presumably, passive investors care about corporate governance because they think this will lead to improved firm performance. 
but it's not necessarily clear if we should expect this to be the case. First, the value implications of any of these specific governance provisions, so things like independent directors on the board, is widely debated in the academic literature. Furthermore, there could be concerns that these investors are following a one-size-fits-all approach to corporate governance, and this is something that may not be good for firm performance. However, we find that on average, long-term performance improves when passive ownership is higher. And so this suggests that the governance reforms implemented by these investors ultimately have long-term lasting effects on real outcomes. So to wrap up, while not active in the traditional sense, that is, these investors aren't going out and launching proxy fights or anything like that, we find that passive investors are not passive owners. This suggests that institutional influence is not limited to just active investors or activist investors. And ultimately, the findings highlight the importance of voice as a mechanism to influence managerial decisions. Thank you. I'm impressed, like you, I've been to many of these and I've never heard an academic present his paper in 10 minutes before. Thank you. Um, those of you who were at the just previous session heard a large discussion about um, whether or not it's companies' roles to deal with global warming. Um, we say we like to present objective research. The Practitioner Prize also, I will quote to you what one institutional investor said to me. She said, I love this paper because I can use it. My board is asking me what to do about the threat of global warming to our portfolio, which I think was David's position. And if anyone has followed any of the investor panels in Paris, um, the debate has moved far beyond what some people seem to think it is. Um, people think that there is a major threat to their portfolio holdings when you're a diversified investor um, from carbon risk. The winning practitioner paper um, is beyond divestment. Using low carbon indices was done by MSCI. The team was Remy Briand, Linda Elling Lee, Sebastian Lieblick, Veronique Menu, and Arag Singh. Um, I'm going to introduce Linda Elling Lee. She is the global head of, MSG research, of ESG research at MSCI. Sorry about that, Linda. Um, and she has considered what should institutional investors do about this, not what should necessarily corporate boards, but the fact of the matter is that capital does dictate some responses. And with that, I will introduce you to Linda. We'll take the photo after. Thank you very much. Well, it's really such an honor to be here to receive the award. Um, on behalf of MSCI, I'd really like to thank the distinguished panel of judges and the IRRC Institute. Uh, we're very uh, proud to be uh, donating our prize money to the CDP, uh, which is the organization formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Milstein Center, of course, for the opportunity to talk to you all of you today um, about our paper this afternoon. You can think of this as a, as a quick 10-minute break from corporate governance talk to ponder something a little more uh, cheerful, which is climate risk. Um, you know, let me uh, start maybe with a little bit of a quick background on, on MSCI and how we came to do this research. Uh, MSCI, to many of you, is probably best known as a leading provider of global equity indexes. Um, there are today more than $9 trillion uh, of investments that are benchmarked to MSCI's all-country world indexes. Uh, we are also the largest provider of environmental, social, and governance uh, research and analysis to the global investment community. So our research agenda is always driven really very much by the investment problems um, that our clients face. And, and this, this paper was particularly interesting because here we're trying to apply objective data and analytical rigor to an area and a topic that tends to be very emotionally charged and very politically charged and, and where the, the competitive landscape and the technological and regulatory landscape is very fluid and evolves uh, very rapidly. Um, all of us are very aware of the fact that we're coming into the crucial final days. Um, 
um, of, the, of the global climate talks in, in Paris. And whatever happens there, I think there will continue to be quite a lot of uncertainties. Uh, there's, the science itself is uncertain um, in terms of the time horizons and the magnitude of impact, as well as the policy scenarios and the technological change. So up until two years ago, I would say, um, all this uncertainty ha had very much paralyzed uh, the financial community. And what changed was that about two years ago, um, the financial community had to confront a, a quandary, a kind of an investment um, puzzle. So what was this quandary? Um, it starts with a scientific consensus. The consensus is that we are heading towards uh, temperature warming uh, that could trigger catastrophic climate change. And if we want to be altering that path of warming and shoot for something like a two degrees Celsius warming threshold, that would entail that we could still put a certain amount of carbon emissions into the air. Now the problem is that the amount of carbon emissions that we can put into the air would mean that we can really only burn about one third of the fossil fuel reserves that we have already discovered. So the question for investors is, you know, what's going to happen to the rest of those fossil fuel reserves? And how should investors really think about the, the financial value that they've already put on fossil fuel assets when there's some chance and some probability that some of it might become stranded and never come out of the ground to realize the full economic value that investors are already dis, um, ascribing to them? So when many of the world's largest um, institutional investors were confronted with this quandary, they came to us and they came to us with two questions. Um, the first is, you know, what, what is our portfolio's exposure to assets that might become stranded either through uh, regulations or through technological substitution? Um, and the second question is, you know, are there any options besides doing nothing on the one hand or going with what some activists um, would be calling for, which is that to divest from fossil fuel companies? So in our paper, we set out to address these two questions. So in terms of thinking about a portfolio's exposure uh, to carbon-stranded assets, um, it's really important to distinguish between two different dimensions um, of potential losses. The first thing you want to do is to identify holdings in companies um, that own fossil fuel reserves. So these are assets that today, we have to remember that today these assets do not actually emit any carbon at all. They simply embody and hold potential future carbon, um, carbon emissions. They're embedded in them. Uh, they may have a chance of never coming out of the ground. Now, the second dimension is that you want to be identifying um, uh, in your portfolio companies that um, have fixed assets that very much rely on burning fossil fuels. So the, the most accessible example would be coal-fired power plants. These might be fixed assets um, that might also have to be abandoned if uh, new energy sources became economically competitive or if regulations or carbon pricing or some other kind of mechanism makes them prohibitively expensive to run to the end of their uh, uh, economically useful life. So when we do this exercise for the MSCI All Country World Index companies, which is composed of, uh, of the roughly 2,300 largest uh, publicly listed companies in the world, including emerging market companies, um, we find that the risk of holding these potential carbon-stranded assets was highly concentrated. Um, the, the top 20% of companies today that are emitting carbon emissions actually constitute more than 80% of the total carbon emissions in the MSCI All Country World Index companies. And if you look at um, actually the concentration of the future carbon emissions that are embedded in fossil fuel holdings of companies in the All Country World Index, we find that just 13 companies are holding fossil fuel reserves in the ground that constitute uh, more than 50% of all the potential future carbon emissions across all companies in the All Country World Index. So what can investors do about their exposure? Well, in our paper, we propose a framework for really thinking through investors' options, um, because it's important to recognize that, of course, um, investors do have quite different investment beliefs and goals, and they differ along four important parameters. For example, you know, their tolerance for short-term risk could be quite different. Uh, the, the strength of their belief in this long-term thesis about um, the risk of carbon-stranded assets can be quite different. Uh, they face very different levels um, of pressure when it comes to communicating with their stakeholders. Um, and then, of course, many of them have different levels of pressure preferences in terms of taking a public stance um, in, in influencing corporate behavior around this topic. 
So if we think about the two main approaches that you can take to reducing your portfolio's carbon exposure, um, you can really reweight companies in your portfolio. Or you can use selection and essentially exclude a set of companies um, from the universe. And if you use the selection approach or the exclusion approach, um, you know, it will primarily give you the benefit of being able to uh, communicate with your stakeholders in a, in a clearer way because it's much easier to be able to say, oh, you don't hold companies X, Y, and Z. Um, it does, however, carry a rather big drawback of ignoring short-term risk because your portfolio could de deviate quite a lot from market risk and return characteristics. Now, reweighting is in some ways the opposite. It's harder to communicate to stakeholders because um, it's a more complex technique. Um, however, this technique does allow you to reduce short-term risk, um, which makes this approach uh, in many ways from a financial standpoint um, more practical for a lot of institutional investors. So let me quickly walk through two concrete examples um, you know, that exemplify these two approaches. So the MSCI, um, all country world, the, the Acqui-X fossil fuel index ex exemplifies a pure selection approach where basically what we've done is exclude every single company in the all country world that has any fossil fuel reserves. Um, and so this, this index is probably closest to uh, the divestment approach that some activists call for here in the US. And now such an index would end up excluding about seven 7% of the market cap of the all-country world, and because it has quite a large skew away from the energy sector, you end up incurring about a 1% tracking error. Um, the reweighting approach is embodied in our construction methodology for the MSCI um, ACWI Low Carbon Target Index. And here what we do is we take a couple of steps. First, we target a very low tracking error, um, 30 basis points, for example, um, to the benchmark. And then we use optimization techniques to substantially reduce, to minimize the carbon reserves exposure and to uh, reduce the carbon emissions. So what we're doing is reweighting every single stock in the all-country world index in order to minimize exposure to those two dimensions of carbon. So with this design, there are no, exclu no exclusions at all. So an investor that would be tracking um, the, all, the, the uh, low carbon target index would essentially have a very similar uh, risk and return characteristics as the all country world index. So from a financial standpoint, um, I think it's going to be hard to see this, which is why you should go to the paper itself. Um, you're going to have to trust me that, that the characteristics are very similar. Now, it is the financial characteristics that have been very attractive to many of the largest um, pension funds around the world that have started to, uh, uh, to pursue this approach. But what has really surprised everyone um, in terms of this approach is how much carbon exposure you can actually reduce while not excluding any companies. So on this chart, um, the left-hand bars are the, the, carbon ex the, the carbon emissions and the, the carbon emissions of the, the benchmark, the all-country world. The middle bar is the low carbon target index approach, which you hold every single company, but, but you, we, we've essentially reweighted all the companies uh, to reduce carbon exposure. And then the right-hand side chart is the, um, the ex-fossil fuel index, where we've excluded the companies that have fossil fuel holdings. And as you can see, it is quite dramatic to be able able to see that, that with this approach of simply reweighting all of the stocks in the All Country World Index, you can actually get very substantial reduction in terms of both fossil fuel reserves exposures as well as a far greater reduction in terms of your carbon emissions today versus the, um, versus the exclusionary approach. So the upshot of our paper is that there is another approach besides doing nothing and beyond divesting. Um, I did say at the outset um, that uh, we, we, you know, our goal is to apply analytical rigor to a topic that really suffers from quite a lot of um, ideologically driven rhetoric. Um, but in terms of trying to make an impression with this audience, um, that, you know, that it's really urgent for us to be able to uh, come up with pragmatic approaches that investors can take today. You know, I'm personally not beyond making a, a more sort of cheap emotional appeal. And this is my cheap emotional appeal. I, didn't, I don't think that anybody thought you could sit through a carbon talk without uh, a picture of a polar bear. So here's your requisite polar bear photo. Um, you know, the, the topic really is extremely important. It is urgent. And, and I thank the IRSC for the opportunity to highlight an approach that we think is both innovative and very practical for investors today.
Um, I wanted to just end by thanking um, the Milstein Center. Um, I wanted to thank our judges. Um, you'll recognize some of the names. Mark Anson is the Chief Investment Officer at Acadia, but former CIO for CalPERS, for Hermes, for Duveen. Um, Cola Chilton, who's the CIO at Williams College. Uh, Bob Danhauser, the Head of Capital Markets for the CFA Institute. Jim Hawley, who's one of the more underrated corporate governance professors out at St. Mary's of California who invented the phrase universal owner. Uh, Rob, our own Robert Jackson, co-director of the Milstein Center, Ed Del Mino, who is not a professor, but most of you know her and she doesn't need uh, the title to be one. Um, I also specifically want to thank Milstein again and the CFA Institute. Um, they really pitched in and publicized this. We got more uh, submissions than we ever had before. And more importantly, the quality of the submissions was so superb that we actually gave for the first time ever honorable mentions to seven other papers, um, many of which, if they had been submitted last year, probably would have won. Um, the, the, the quality went up that, that greatly. Um, you can see the papers. Uh, here comes the commercial. You got a polar bear, I get a commercial. Uh, at ircinstitute.org, everything we do is free and publicly available. Um, you can also sign up for our email. The next three reports that are coming out will be about CEO disclosure, CEO succession planning disclosure, control corporations and their characteristics, a hot topic at this um, entity I know and risk disclosure by companies. And with that, I have the pleasure of saying you have a 10-minute break. <laughs>